if you haven't noticed, it seems like we're starting to get more and more people coming back and everything, and that's very exciting. So that just means all of our newer people have a lot of people to meet now. Um, so uh, the weekly volunteers for this week, we have uh, Mike McGrath, Miley Foster, Kathy Wickeiser, Chris Fakir, Trevor Nolan. Oh, oh, okay, some of you didn't volunteer, I guess, but thank you anyway. Okay, you can owe it to the club later. Um, and then for birthdays, and the birthday boy's not here, um, it was Rodney's birthday this last Sunday, so um, rumor has it he had a great time. Um, and then our Rotary anniversaries this past week, we have Tom Nelson, where are you Tom? I know you're here. Tom, hey, happy eighth anniversary to you. And I, I don't see Carmen, but Carmen Matei, her, birth, or, um, her anniversary is also eight years, same day and everything. So I guess you guys joined on the same day. They're twins, yes, <laughs> that's right. All right, so um, uh, Chris Fakir is going to come up and do our um, introducing our visitors and Zoom guests. Yeah, I know. I am two for two today. I, <laughs> I, I, my, 2020 resolu my 2022 resolution was to allow a little bit of my extroverted side to come out, so here it is. Um, for visiting Rotarians, we have Again, Ms. Po Pu from Rotary Club Metro Yongon. Thank you for being here again. Um, for our guest speaker, we have, and I just want to acknowledge y'all being here, Russell Keller and Megan Warren. So thank y'all for being here with Matthew. And then um, for our Rotarians who have brought guests, I'm going to start with Ms. Kathleen because she's right to my left. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, I have a very exciting guest to introduce you to, Shannon, who you might notice at my table here next to Chip, between Chip and Monique. Um, this is Shannon, the wife of the guy who did the satellite butterfly this last year for flight. So um, Rudy, her husband, and Shannon are interested in being part of our club, so be extra nice. All right, and then next, I'm gonna hop to my buddy Chip. We got a mic, no mics. Oh, man, we get yelled at all the time for no mic. Right? You want my mic? Uh -huh. You want my mic? No. It's I'm taping. too loud. It's taping. I'm too loud. Yes, you are. <laughs> so, this is my guest, Sandy Black, and she is a dino in the community, and she wanted to come and see what Rotary was about. I met Sandy through Colorado Springs Rising Professional which is just that, the Rising Professionals in Colorado Springs. Um, she is the president of that, and she's doing a lot with it. And I'm excited for any that are going to be coming from her in our community. Sandy. 
right, next up we have Chris Lewis. She has a guest with her. Lastly, for our up and coming president, Ms. Kay Rindleman. Thank you, thank you. So Carrie Pearson has been doing some phenomenal research on um, club members who are really amazing, and, and especially some that are no longer here. He, it started with his World War II um, research, and um, he brought me several, and he said, wow, you guys have some amazing Rotarians. And so he wrote some things up for me and although I totally forgot my readers today, I um, would like to share this one because Leslie Cook is going to be our first one. And I think there's a lot of people in this room that are very qualified to talk about her. But since she was my sponsor's sponsor, or my grand sponsor, then I'm going to read what Carrie found and, and also tell you a little bit. Um, Leslie Cook was born um, February, no way, February 17, Okay, no, that, that was the date of the article. I was like, she, okay, yes? Vita? Oh, thank you, yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Thank you. Okay, so Leslie Cook, who many of you might remember that she passed away about an hour before kickoff of Super Bowl, um, in 2016. Um, she passed away February 7, 2016 in Pikes Peak Hospice at Penrose Hospital. She was born February 4, 1927 in Colorado Springs to Arthur and Marie Johnson. She held a BA degree in drama from Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Leslie had a distinguished professional career that included director of children's theater for the Fine Arts Center, KRDO radio and TV, and executive director of the Pikes Peak chapter of the American Red Cross for 30 years. Occupational highlights included the opening of the first Red Cross shelter nationwide, establishing the Child Enrichment Center for Children, directing a $1 million combined federal campaign, and developing the Youth Volunteer Center. She was awarded, she was awarded the Sertoma Service to Mankind Award twice, American Bar Association Liberty Bell, Partners in Philanthropy Outstanding Fundraising Volunteer, the first United Way Spirit of Commitment Award, Red Cross Coming Home Honorary Chair, and the Urban Peak Colorado Springs Pathmaker Award. Her community service included chairmanships for Keep Colorado Springs Beautiful, Pikes Peak Community Action Agency, and Centered Life education, counseling, and spiritual care. Leslie was a charter member of the Chamber of Commerce Foundation, treasurer for Keep Colorado Springs Beautiful, secretary for Full Circle, uh, co-chaired the Friends of Lowell School Group, served on the Pikes Peak Center Board and the Homeward Pikes Peak Board, and served on as board secretary for the Urban Peak Colorado Springs. Leslie was a charter member of the Faith-Based uh, Education Board she was official spokesperson for United Way campaign in 2000. Leslie was the second woman in, Pike, in the Pikes Peak region to become a Rotarian and a longtime member of PEO Chapter CE. I don't know what that is, but it sounds great. Um, Leslie was mother of six children, 12 grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren. She summed up her life and career by saying, in the long run, it's all about the children. It's always about the children. 
Uh, that was one article that, um, that Carrie found. And then there was another one that was done um, after her memorial service. I don't know how many of you guys were at her memorial service, but I imagine quite a few Rotarians. And, um, and it was a beautiful memorial service. I remember that Bob Holmes, who, sponsor, who, who she sponsored into the club, um, he got up and spoke um, just about how much impact one human being could make. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, I spent Thanksgiving with her my first year in the club. And um, I remember as she was just kind of telling me her past and everything, uh, she mentioned that one of the things she was really interested in Rotary about was the, the polio eradication. She said that when her son was very young, they thought that he had polio. And, you know, even as she was telling me this story, like 100 years later, she was still very teary about it. It was such a passion to her. And so that's what really um, got her to come into the club once women were allowed. And, um, and then staying in, I think she loved the butterflies. She loved flight. And the year that Jason Aguilar um, chaired flight and actually rebranded and made it flight, he, um, the, the committee uh, rented a vehicle so that we could take Leslie up to the Butterfly Pavilion um, in uh, Westminster. And she was, because she had one of those big, huge, jazzy wheelchairs that, you know, were hard to move. So we had to have that van. And, um, and so I helped drive her up there and back. And I'm telling you, she was speechless. Um, most of the time, she was just so in the moment and having such a good time. Um, there was something else I was going to tell you about. Oh, and, and one of the pictures, I believe, was it? Did you have more pictures? Oh, so you can see Leslie holding a tarantula right there. And apparently the woman not only was amazing, but she was fearless because I took that picture and I was like, I used a telephoto lens, I think, to take that picture. But, um, oh, and here you can see the group that took her up to, um, to the Butterfly Pavilion. So anyway, I'm so glad that Carrie found this information and it just um, makes me feel so good to be able to talk about her. I know that so many of you have your own stories about Leslie and I think one of the sweetest ones that I ever heard was John Buckley and how much she meant to him. So um, anyway, I just, uh, um, just wanted to highlight her and we're calling this our heritage moment. We're gonna try to do this most weeks. We have quite a few Rotarians still to talk about and, and share with and I won't be the one that does it usually but I was just really excited when Leslie was the first one. So anyway, thank you for indulging me. And, uh, and to Leslie, boy, what a, what a lady, how lucky we were to have her in the club. Trevor Deerdorf has an announcement for us. Wow. Congratulations, Mike. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Holly. All right, so we have a, a white badge. I'm going to ask Kay to come up. And this week, Kay is presenting a white badge to Lynn Pearson. And the Pearsons have been great uh, new members as a couple to our, to our club. Uh, Carrie, an existing, and Lynn as a new member, and we're, we're very fortunate to have them. So come on up, okay? Lynn? I am so excited. Um, it's been an honor it is to be the sponsor for Lynn. She and her husband jumped in right away, have gotten so involved in the club and our committees. Uh, it's been amazing. We are so blessed 
to have Lynn as a new member, so I welcome her up to tell us a little bit about her history. Thank you. Actually, I feel very blessed to be able to be a member of this club. Uh, my husband, Carrie, has been a Rotarian for 32 years. And when I first met him, he introduced me to Rotary and what it was all about. And frankly, as he shared with me some of the mission of Rotary, I thought it sounded very Miss America-like, which means not very attainable, um, but sounds good. And the reality is, as I had the opportunity over the years to participate in a lot of different Rotary events, um, it, I saw how there was real meaning behind those words and what an opportunity to be around a lot of great people that make the world a kinder, gentler, just nicer place in everything they, they say and do. Um, so it's a blessing. Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's where I grew up and went to school, and all of my immediate family still lives there. I'm the black sheep that left. Um, I took a job transfer to Chicago, which is where I met Carrie, so it was a good thing. Um, I spent my entire career in some form of banking, initially starting out working for a banking technology company that we developed software for uh, banks to use in their treasury management area, services area. Uh, about halfway through that, I switched over to actually working for a bank uh, in the commercial area in uh, national healthcare treasury management. And in my experience, most people who haven't worked in treasury management or in the treasury area of a corporation have absolutely no idea what that means. So I'll give you a little nutshell explanation uh, basically, I worked with large corporations really on a consultative kind of basis to evaluate their operational cash flows in and out and work with them on how to optimize those, optimize working capital, define how to do that all in a fraud averse and secure means as well as ensuring that they were in compliance from a regulatory standpoint. So really exciting stuff. <laughs> um, I retired in April 2020, just in time to be in the height of the pandemic, so Carrie and I had envisioned doing a lot of travel that didn't happen. So we're planning to do more of that this year. We have a 23-year-old son who is why we ended up in Colorado Springs, because his first job out of college was here. He's an ASIC R&D engineer for Keysight Technologies, and we came out with him to help him find a place to live and get settled and said, gosh, this seems like a nice place, better winters than Illinois. Do you mind if we come too? And he said, so long as you don't live right next door to me, I'm good with that. <laughs> so that's how we got to Colorado Springs and we're thrilled to be here. It's a much better climate and lots more interesting outdoor things to do, which we love here. Uh, I only miss my garden back in Chicago, which I spent many years developing and gardening in Colorado is a little bit different than gardening in the Midwest. So I'm on an immersive learning curve with that, with the Horticultural Arts Society. The gardeners there have been a great help to me, and that's one of my passions is gardening and just enjoying the outdoors in general and being with family. So look forward to the opportunity of getting to know many of you better and being part of this club. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, we are running short on time. I want to get to our speaker, but I just want to remind everybody that after the flight meeting um, at 3 o'clock, uh, those who want to participate are meeting at Millibo Art Theater. We're going to, Harding's Nursery is going to be planting a tree for the Rotarians that we la lost last year, and we have a plaque to install with it and everything. If you want to come for this, you, you don't have to dig or anything. All the planting is being done by Harding's Nursery. Um, but we are looking for people that would come and say a few nice words about um, those that we lost last year. Um, Buzz Rieger, Rhea Waltman, and who am I forgetting? Oh, Scott Feller, I'm sorry, Scott Feller, yeah. So um, any of you that have something to say about those, that would be really nice if you could show up there and, and help us. And then we're going to do a little bit of garden cleanup there at Millibo as well, just because it's Earth Month. Um, now I want to introduce Chip to um, come up here and introduce our speaker.
What is that? We have an Amber Alert going on? Okay. Wow. I am tall. Um, so, I wore this shirt just for Rodney, and he's not even here. Not even Zooming. Not even Zooming. Okay, um, it's funny because um, I have Matthew's bio, but I'm not one to go much on a bio. Um, I'm going to introduce very quickly Matthew Ayers. He has quite a few titles. He's a pastor. He's a CEO. Many other things, but I think what is important to me is the titles that are most important to him, and that's as a husband and a father. He has given so much to this community by founding Dream Centers, which I think he's going to talk about today. Um, but he is a master of many trades. He was previously in the Air Force, and it takes somebody of a special caliber to walk away from that and to found an organization such as Dream Centers where he had this vision of helping the community. And he has dedicated so much to this community. I met Matthew and I had no idea of his other titles. I just knew that he was a really good person. And those are sometimes few and far between in this world. So I would like to introduce Matthew Ayers. Yes, he is the pastor and CEO of Dream Centers, but he is a husband, a father, and my friend. Excellent. Thank you for that. You know, I don't know, uh, I'm sure you guys know Chip really well. And, oh, we're taped up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stick, I can untape it? Okay. Uh, if, if Chip and I were, went through undergrad or grew up together or whatever, I'd imagine we would have gotten into a lot of trouble. I'm actually glad I met you later in life. Uh, I don't know if any, is, I think I saw a few Zoomies in here. Are there? Uh-huh. Hi, John. So, what, uh, I, I made the Century Club at the Academy in the 90s. So, for you who don't know what that means, uh, I marched 138 tours. I found all of the secret hidden spots in the Air Force Academy where you could actually hide in the middle of a tour and people would not find you. And by the end of it, I was right back in line finishing up that official tour. When, so what that means is you march around for an hour back and forth on a line because you did something wrong. <laughs> so, Chip, I'm so glad we met later in life. I would have been very damaging to you. <laughs> so. Anyway, back in the 90s, when I was here, I just knew, I fell in love with this community. Uh, as, as all of you know who have been here for any amount of time, it's a special place. And, um, and so my big dream, I thought, uh, was that I would come back here, teach for 30 years at the academy, then retire, and then start this nonprofit. Uh, but when I came back in 2006 and 2007 and was working at USAFA, uh, this... Um, energy and vision for the nonprofit just wouldn't let go of me. So it ended up, uh, I ended up, I voluntarily separated in 2007 and have been here ever since and just absolutely love it. And it's because every single day I get to see my heroes, the people, the patients, the residents in our programs. Uh, they work harder than anyone I've ever met. And they've faced more obstacles than anyone I've ever met. And they show such grit, resilience, determination, joy, gratitude, all through it. And still to this day, almost 11 years into it, it, it moves me it just every time I think about it. So this is a little presentation about Dream Centers. And this was really the idea that every single city has some gaps in care. It doesn't matter where you go. Uh, there are things that you know we're not quite meeting certain needs. So we didn't start with a vision about doing any kind of program. We actually, I just started interviewing leaders throughout the community and saying, what are the points of pain? What are we missing right now in our community? And so after about six months of doing that research, um, it became really clear about a dozen different things where there were some major gaps in care in our community. And two of those that we decided to start addressing uh, back in 2011 were behavioral health 
and women's health. So I never had an idea, any, any kind of idea in my mind that we would start a women's clinic, but that's what the community needed, and we loved the city. So we started off with the women's clinic. Also on that list was family homelessness, was becoming a major, major challenge in this community. And it was uh, hidden behind the scenes, people who are experiencing homelessness, but getting their kids to school and to childcare every day and living out of cars and situations like that. So, so those were what we began with. We launched the clinic in 2011 in Mary's home in 2015. And the vision with this is that there would be no, we would continue to grow learn every day, make all the mistakes, grow these programs so big enough so that eventually no willing person is turned away. And that's what we're really about with Dream Centers. So when we started with the women's clinic, uh, there was a whole bunch of volunteers, about 200 volunteers locally, medical professionals that just have a huge heart for service. And that's what we started with, volunteers, not staff. And now we've got about five staff and a few hundred volunteers still uh, every day. We're in the very center of the city geographically near Austin Bluffs and Academy. And we're doing things like specialized women's health, integrated with behavioral health, and then a ton of wraparound services like medical massage therapy and chiropractic and other things that people need. So when we started, um, this is, I'll just show some pictures of patients and, and they'll represent other patients. I can't share their pictures uh, for confidence, but uh, our very first patient uh, Bella was just, it's one of my favorite stories still to this day. So she had all the women's health challenges and yet was also very suicidal, uh, had a, a rare diagnosis, double diagnosis of severe bipolar and schizophrenia. And there was a lot of reasons, things that happened to her that had contributed to a life of chronic stress and violence around her life. So when we saw her and she began getting help at the women's clinic, she developed some really amazing relationships of trust over time. And I remember feeling absolutely floored when after about a year of counseling, coming to the clinic every week for her safe place and her behavioral health, mental health appointments, she told me, these people here in this place literally saved my life. And they were all volunteers. They were all volunteers. So every day we get to hear stories like that from Bella and from patients like her that just don't quite have enough resources and have no idea that this is going on. So we can help get the word out that this is completely free for any woman 13 to 64 in town. Another patient, I love this story. This is a pretty typical story. Uh, recent college grad. She was working two part-time jobs, trying to land her dream job in a career that she really wanted, but in the meantime, making ends meet, couple minimum wage jobs, and so she barely made enough to not qualify for Medicare, barely. But she didn't make enough to sometimes put gas in the tank, right? So this is kind of what happens typically. We're caught in those in-between situations, and she also became suicidal. She was depressed, she was full of anxiety, she was about to lose her jobs, came to the clinic, got the medical care she needed, got the behavioral health she needed, and she is absolutely thriving in her dream job today, who another volunteer at the women's clinic helped her land. So it's a real special place where these kind of stories just happen naturally every day. And it's from people like you who are volunteering at Rotary, it's People just like you who are spending their volunteer time at the women's clinic changing people's lives. Okay, so this is Mary's home. We launched this a few years later in 2015 based on the need to help families exit homelessness permanently. So I don't know if you guys know this, but this, this was shocking to me when I began doing the research. But families, female-led families, single moms, who have kids, usually in their mid-20s, with an infant and a toddler. They're the largest group of people experiencing homelessness in the country, and they're the fastest growing. We don't know that because we don't often see them. They're getting it done. That's why I say there's some, they're my heroes. They're some of the hardest working people I know. They're getting their kids off to childcare or school every day, which is amazing. But these kids you see here, residents at Mary's home, I don't know if you know this, 
one child on average, it's more than one now child, in every public school classroom is experiencing homelessness. That's a lot. So if you think about your kids or your grandkids, for some of you, in school, in Colorado Springs or whatever community you know of, they're sitting next to another kid who is experiencing homelessness in that classroom. And it's a crisis across our country. It's a tragedy. The government doesn't have enough money to take care of those issues. In fact, they, the, the issues across the whole continuum of care of homelessness are so big, they've sort of switched strategies a few years ago and let the pendulum swing, swing and the vast majority of government funding is going in to support people who are extremely chronically homeless. So severe mental health challenges, oftentimes on the street or in shelters, and that's all the government's going to have capacity to do in the, into the future. So what about all these other areas where, like our clients, their typical situation is they're doing great, but the violence begins in the home, there's been some generational poverty challenges, and then all of a sudden, when the kids are threatened with violence, that's when mom usually splits. And, and here's the progression. A few months to a year, staying on friends' couches, it gets unstable, you wear out your welcome. A few months to a year in a car, that's unsustainable. The chronic stress and the trauma living out of your car on the streets, especially in a place in Colorado Springs, and trying to get through a winter, it's nearly impossible. So usually within two to three years, these families end up in a shelter. Kids go to DHS, mom goes to a shelter. So we don't want to have that happen. That's the whole goal with Mary's Home. We stop it right in the middle of that one to three year cycle and provide a safe place where a family can land and take up to five years, get a GED, get a four year degree, get all the emotional healing, all their own dreams. And we're there with a highly supportive environment to support them in that. Okay, so research, this is, this is a, a great thing that's been done for over 35 years now. A lot of people have poured their lives into research on specific family homelessness. So we just based our program off of that. The government doesn't have a program like this. If they did, they'd have a program that was up to five years and would help a family build capacity and launch into a career. We don't. We have some good programs, but they're pretty short term. Okay, so uh, Sheila will represent for me the first family that came through Mary's home in 2015. Grew up in the foster care system. Not only was she severely physically and sexually abused by her biological family, but then that same pattern continued to happen in foster care. So she fled violence when she was 18, got out of the home, stuck out her thumb on the freeways, traveled across country, landed in Colorado Springs, got herself a minimum wage job, was living out of her car with her kids, was doing amazing things, she's resilient, and right when we were remodeling Mary's home, she was walking to work every day. And she saw what was happening, and we got to know her and got to talk to her. And I remember her, her little son was almost two and a half years old at the time, and she wept so long and hard that first day of moving in, we couldn't have a conversation with her. She wept so hard the next day we couldn't have a conversation with her. Finally, the next night, we got to sit down with her and say, what is happening? What's going on inside your heart, your mind right now? And she said, his whole life, almost two and a half years, I've had to hold him in my arms at night, on the streets, in a car, in a house where I was being abused, and hold him while he shook and cried himself to sleep. First night here, last night at Mary's home, he crawled over straight to his bed, pulled his covers up, and went to bed with a smile on his face. And she was just overwhelmed. She was just overwhelmed. So this is the amazing reality of these families we get to serve. And this is the vision again, until no one has turned away. So we have over, since we started in 2015, over 400 families approach us locally. Uh, our capacity right now is to take care of 19 families at a time. So it's a drop in the bucket, but step by step, day by day, we're getting there and we're growing. Okay, so let me go back here. What's next? Behavioral health, we already knew, was a rising challenge in the community. COVID accelerated that. So we need a Dream Center's campus. We need to consolidate 
grow bigger, grow capacity, both for the women's clinic and for Mary's Home, and possibly other programs in the future. But we will not move forward until we're able to grow capacity. So here's just a little preview. We know that already, just with Mary's Home and a few other programs that have started in the community, the children we serve, the, the families who have children in the Mary's Home program, right now, 60% of them get on a waiting list when they move in to become residents at Mary's Home for CPCD. That's Head Start, Early Head Start, and Colorado Preschool Program. So the kinds of care that they need with staff who are trauma-informed and know how to care for them, they can't even get into that. So we can't even grow Mary's Home program unless we open an early care and education center. So that will be our next program we open. And right now we're under contract for about five acres right next to Memorial Park. Um, hopefully we get to close on that soon. And that will be some of the next vision that I hope for you to help me share around the community is how do we pay for this land, this property, open a school so that then eventually we can build more apartments and care for more families who are my heroes. So all this started when I was a little kid in middle school. And my grandpa grew up in China. He was overseas. Uh, his dad, my great-grandfather, opened up schools and orphanages and cared for people actually in Wuhan that we know has become famous today for where the coronavirus came from. And he would come to visit uh, our little hometown, wherever we lived at the time, in Washington State. And I remember going out to, usually the first thing that Grandma and Grandpa would do when they were visiting is take us out to Chinese. So we'd go to the local Chinese food restaurant, and he spoke Mandarin fluently, and he'd go straight back to the kitchen. He'd grab some laborers who were working hard and telling jokes and just start talking in their local language and making friends. Usually we'd get all this free food, too. That was kind of a nice benefit that they'd dump out. But we became friends with all of these Chinese families wherever we went. And I remember one day he brought this couple home to our house. And we found out, we heard their story, we found out they had been labor trafficked. So the, the owner of the restaurant had lied to them. And then he took us, my mom and I, and this couple downtown into this little shack. And I was, I think, 11 years old. And it was my first exposure to extreme living conditions in the U.S. People living in poverty who are being taken advantage of. And there was a dirt floor. We went in this dark alley in a pretty shady area of town. And I remember seeing rats run across the floor and these two thin little sleeping mats that were on the floor. And they had a little side wooden table and no running water, no electricity. This, is, this was their home. And um, that's where the spark of inspiration came to start Dream Centers. Now we know, we've heard these stories, we know that people live in our communities in pretty tough situations, but we often don't have the chance to actually see them and hear their stories. And I can tell you that they're real and it still happens today. We hear them from our clients every day. There's really tough things going on, but I'm also here to say that just like you, Rotarians, and all the amazing volunteers we have, this community is the most generous community I've ever been a part of. And so together, uh, I'm seeing it happen now. I know we can take on these big challenges. Uh, we can raise awareness together. And it changes me every day. It's the most rewarding work I've ever done. So I just feel such gratitude for being here, for having a chance to share with you today. I know you're all servants. You love our community. You serve our community. So thank you for what you do. And I'd love to just take a few minutes for any questions you might have. About two million operating budget. So about a million dollars to run each program and several hundred volunteers in each program. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways to volunteer. So we do the one, two, three, four projects 
during the year, partner with Because I Love You, partner with other organizations. So there's great work you can do. If your schedule doesn't allow you to be a regular volunteer, you can come and do a, a one-off project. Uh, so just go to dreamcenters.com. We've got an easy way to volunteer. Um, you fill out an application. You give us your references. Usually the slowest part in the process is your references calling us back. <laughs> so as long as we can get through that, we're good to go. Um, but we've got all kinds of positions, too, that are regular and ongoing. So uh, if you want to bring administrative skills, executive skills to help build the programs and speak into strategic planning, being a teacher at Mary's Home, being a family support team who drives a family to appointments when they don't have their driver's license yet, on and on. There's, there, we basically, we're creating these healing environments surrounding these families and these patients with the right resources that they need to heal and transition through their crisis season. And we do that mostly, I would say 95% of the work we do is through volunteers. So that's, that's the main thing we're trying to do is create an environment and an opportunity for people to come together in this community and serve each other. I, uh, let me give you a few of those. I don't know about greatest, but one is just awareness. So we're right now 10 years in just building awareness. Uh, we really focused hard on just building the two programs. So it's really been grassroots, word of mouth. We're starting to do a little more, uh, you know, raise the banner and, and get the word out. But I think even just telling people about, even clients, potential clients. So especially that situation I shared about the recent college grad, a lot of people in the service industry, a lot of recent college grads, a lot of people who are working hard but don't necessarily have access to some of the other support systems locally, they're underinsured. And I guarantee you, they will never go take care of their own women's health issue, even though they know it's painful, they know they have a big challenge, because they'd rather put food on the table for their kids or gas in the tank and keep their job and all those things they have to manage. So getting the word out to people you know who could use the, the resources and the services, that's huge. Um, and then I think, too, it, this grows, I mean, you know, a nonprofit, it takes, it takes the community linking arms. And so I think um, there's a lot of different ways. I wouldn't, uh, specialist care is always a challenge. So we can often get uh, female uh, PAs, NPs, OBGYNs to serve, but even some of the other specialties that we need to refer to, um, we would love more specialty care providers at the women's clinic. So that's a big one. And then I think the family support team and child watch team at Mary's Home is a big one. I mentioned the challenge of getting into CPCD. We're on a waiting list. Only 40% of our clients right now can get into CPCD. The children in the Mary's Home program, because they've been exposed often to violence and chronic stress, if they go to a regular child care center in town and it's like 30, 40 kids in the classroom and it's not the fault of that child care center or the workers at all, they have the best intent, but there's no training to deal with what they've been through. And they will often, because the behavioral issues come out, get kicked out. So child watch, child support teams, we do great training. We'll support you with all you need, but those are, those are huge areas we need. I don't know anything about that program, but I know that I love that there's another program in town. We need more like that. Yeah, in Great questions. Thank you. Great questions. Okay, so it's not a 400 waiting list. I wish it could be like that. 
Uh, and I wish, and, it, and if fa- families were stable enough to maintain the stability in their lives to be on a waiting list and be in contact, that would be great. But so if you look at the continuum of care and think about people from really stable all the way to in crisis mode, these families are in crisis mode. That means they can't hang around and wait for a solution. So we had, we're approached by more than 400 families a year. We have pretty strict, limited intake criteria, so you asked how we decide. Already, just because there's so many families, we limit it. We say it's a female-led family with three kids or fewer that are seven years old or under and clean and sober for at least six months. So often what we'll do, if somebody's not ready for a program like this, we'll help them find another program in the state or even work really hard into in other states. Um, a lot of people, it's helping them transition into a, re- a rehab program. Um, and then when we narrow it down to that, it's probably only about 200, about half, maybe 150 to 200 who are, ap- who are ready for the program. And so we just select. It's a long interview process. And we try to, what we're trying to determine is who's the most highly motivated because we want to see success. So success rates, we measure three things up to three years out. So after a family launches Mary's Home, we meet with them every year for three years. We can meet for the, with them for longer, but we record these steps because we know if they're stable for three years after Mary's Home, they're going to be stable. So uh, self-reported safe and their kids safe, 94%. Uh, Maintain stable housing during that period of time, 86%. And on minimal government subsidies and support, which means like off of TANF, the regular kind of day-to-day support, and that's in the high 60s. I think it's 60 up to 68% now. So those are our, those are our criteria for, and that's across the board, all the families since 2015 till now. have questions you want to um, come up to him and and ask um, he will be here for a few minutes let's see what did Karen think oh. <laughs> oh, see. she knows me already yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah oh thank you and then we have a certificate for you there thank you so thank much for coming you. to talk to us about this this is really incredible thanks Jeff yeah. Yeah. thank you thank, thank you everyone thank you. Yeah, I'll be here Okay, so just a quick reminder, uh, those that want to go over to Millibo, we're going to be starting that project between 245 and 3 um, to have a tree planted and then uh, do some cleanup. Have a great week.